here on behalf of the University of Sheffield to talk to you about our method of taking genetic improvement and using it on quantum programs to retarget those programs on new or different hardware that may not have the properties that they were inten uh, originally intended to be run on. Um, so the main point is that we have this, this genetic improvement method um, and it's automated and lets us refactor quantum software to new hardware. Uh, and the reason we want to show you that this is useful is that we're taking quantum computing, which is a very hard uh, field to develop code efficiently for, and we're trying to make it easier by automating areas that would require specialist knowledge so that they no longer require that specialist knowledge. Uh, so we're going to discuss some quantum computing, we're going to discuss the key points of genetic um, improvement in genetic programming and why we made certain decisions about our model. Then we'll talk about our model and our experiments, and then we'll go over some results. So first things first, why are we using quantum at all? The main argument for quantum is simply that there is a rationale that quantum computers can efficiently solve problems that a classical computer could not, um, because their base part, the quantum bit or the qubit, is more powerful than a classical bit. Uh, we'll get into exactly why later. Um, the difficulty with doing this is that it relies us on, being, on us being able to exploit the fundamental properties of the quantum computer. Uh, and it's very difficult to do this. It's difficult to get an intuition, and it's currently only really done um, by quantum computing experts. Um, but there is a lot of room to make this easier, uh, and the main argument we want to make is if we automate these things, then when you're working on it, you don't need to worry about it, and this makes it more welcoming to software engineers who may have computer science or programming backgrounds, but may not have these physics or specialist hardware backgrounds. So we're just going to talk about the qubit for a bit. Uh, the qubit has two familiar points on the top and the bottom. This is the 0 and the 1 that is represented by a classical machine. Uh, in addition, they can be a combination of these states. You can see on the right, there's a, it's a combination of the 0 and the an unreal part representing the 1. Uh, and what this effectively breaks down to is there is a probability that when you observe your quantum computing state, it becomes a zero, and when you observe it, it becomes a one. However, the quantum bit over time evolves as if it was in the exact superposition state, which is very useful. Um, all you need to know is that we can represent a single qubit as a point on a sphere, as pictured, uh, and that we can make up multiple qubits as combinations of this same th three-dimensional model. The advantage of this is that qubits are quantum particles, and that means they have some quantum properties. So all qubits are connected, qubits naturally evolve over time, all at the same time, uh, and qubits being particles are naturally the same shape structure as quantum particles, because they're the same thing. So there is a strong argument that if we can exploit the system properly, we can, uh, if we can align these systems, we can do things that you cannot do classically. Uh, one of the most promising takes is simulating quantum particles uh, and qu simulating quantum systems, which is useful for areas such as chemistry. Uh, we can do this with qubits, and we probably would not be able to do s such large ones with classical bits. Um, and we're dealing with a very specific part of this. We're dealing with quantum circuit synthesis. So we've got this high-level description of matrix transformations that represents our, for example, quantum particle system. And we want to get it onto this piece of hardware in a bunch of physically runnable instructions that the hardware can do. Um, and the difficulty here, here is that each piece of hardware can do a different set of physical actions and is connected in different ways. So in order for us to run our uh, abstract algorithm, we need to break it down into not just some actions, but hardware specific actions. And we want to make that into um, an automated process. So genetic programming obviously involves quite a large range of areas that genetic algorithms can, can encompass, but we want to focus on the solution, the mutation, and the fitness function, and, and why we made the choices that we made when doing this. So to represent our solution, we use what's called a ZX graph. This is a graph calculus specifically designed to represent 
quantum circuits. Uh, and the reason we took the ZX graph is that the input calculus has rewrite rules in the language that can naturally be used to take one graph and turn it into another identically functional graph with a different shape. Uh, and that's what we used for our mutation funks, functions. Just rewrite rules that did not change the value of the graph, but did change the, um, the structure. Uh, and then for a fitness function, we're trying to minimize error through gate ordering. So we wanted to look at a function that represented the error caused by the thing we were optimizing. So we took the minimizing the error produced by gates. Uh, uh, so just quick look at what ZX actually looks like. Uh, ZX just consists of nodes and wires. Each node represents a gate. Each wire either consists of um, an input output. So uh, a wire from the left to the right says this output feeds to the next output. Um, we can also make these blue which represents a Hadamard gate, which you can think of as a quantum Fourier function. Um, all three of these are identical. We've, this isn't a structural change, but the, the rest of our rewrite rules work very similarly, where we don't change any values, but we do rewrite what the, what the system looks like. Then for our experiments, we split them up into a number of categories. Uh, so for we had a small number of qubits, which was two or three, a large number being four or five, and then for the 14 qubit machine, we had a special case of uh, 14 to 10-ish qubits. Um, we also looked at gate depth. This isn't the same as the number of gates. This is the maximum amount of gates being run at abstraction point on a single qubit, um, although we could break that when we, we compiled later on. Uh, and then finally, we split into three hardwares we had available. These are all IBM Q machines. They're named after the location they're in. Tenerife and Yorktown are both 5 qubit, while Melbourne is 14. Tenerife also has more uniform error and more connections than Yorktown. So we expect it to be harder to build programs on Yorktown than we do on, on Tenerife. We started with random circuits, but we also looked at compiling some handwritten algorithms uh, to make sure that our, our process functioned correctly. So first things first. Um, for smaller gates, uh, so you can see three, five, ten gates, we have the probability of a single run succeeding, which would repeat these runs to build up the probability distribution, which lets us uh, rebuild the unobservable quantum state from just the observable zeros and ones we'd get from repetition. Um, but the higher that is, the better, and you can see that our genetic improvement method was higher than the, the standard search method that we used before, which is good. Uh, and these also all resulted in printable pieces of code, which is also good. Um, they do curve down slowly as you make the machine bigger, but between 3, 5, and 10, the, the problem was simple enough that complexity wasn't the issue. We'll, we'll get to bigger ones later. Yorktown has a similar result. Um, however, you can see the curve actually bends a little downwards at 2, if we just go back. Uh, so, as expected, Yorktown was a little less flexible. So at two qubits, it found a little bit of difficulty because um, it doesn't have as much room to use, which is interesting. And then finally, Melbourne follows the same curve. Those last four ones aren't actually identical. They're just very, very similar. Um, fundamentally, the number of the gates ended up being very similar. So the the error per qubit was uh, ended up being very, very similar as well. Um, Then we're looking at larger gates. So it's important to note, uh, we want to see how well things scale, so we just want to see how this functions. Um, these machines weren't really built to run hundreds of quantum gates in a row, so they did start performing poorly. So we're not looking at absolute error, we want to see relative error. Um, so we did still find improvements, but these are less practically useful. Uh, so of note, that change in that first two and three from 60% to 30% is actually quite a big deal. Uh, having your successful runs on average outnumber your unsuccessful runs makes it much easier to discern the real probability distribution from the noise. So that's fantastic. Um, you can see something similar with uh, at four, um, but we don't quite we don't quite get over the the, the 50 to 50 there. Um, down at the hundreds, error rates are very low, but you can see that our method is still quite a bit higher. 
um, with a bit more optimization. Um, yeah. Yorktown, as before, two qubits, much worse. But the, the three, four, five general downturn can still be seen with our method performing well um, overall. Uh, then finally, we're looking at Melbourne. The first three are there just to show the trend. Um, the little bit of divergences between the the 11, 12, 13, 14 will not be visible. That's okay, they are very small, but they are there. Uh, and then finally, you can see on that last one, the error rates here are very, very high. So we did have to change that axis. Um, so it's not performing better than the, the previous one, the 100 to the 50. It's just, we've changed the axis. Uh, and then finally, we're looking at some real systems. The main thing we wanted to see is that do these real systems, uh, can they be fully compiled? So can we just take a, a real program and then run it through our genetic improvement and then compile it? We expect they would. They're generally smaller and more structured than our random ones. Um, so let's just have a look at the results. Uh, and what you can see is those full 100% ones are programs that we've run through and they've just worked. Um, and the rest of the one, just because it's not 100%, doesn't mean it's failed, uh, it just means that we've had to result on to more base swap methods that are less efficient. Um, but overall, we're quite happy getting uh, those four on the right just fully compiled, um, and overall we're counting this as quite a big success. Uh, and then we're just briefly to discuss scalability and reliability. Um, how do we know this scales well? We do not have a proof of complexity class we're not trying to get one, that's that's well out of scope. We're looking at this from a uh, more practical engineering perspective. But the, the rewrite rules do run fairly efficiently as far as fitness functions go. The fitness function was the most expensive cost. Um, we know it's an accurate quantum machine and that lowers the cost by a lot. Um, there are ways that we could optimize how we're searching as well. Um, the graph structure is useful for its power and flexibility, but it's difficult if we want to try and keep it constrained. So a function that either limited our search space or moved it from uh, the more abstract ones that are nice in theory, just to keep in the constant uh, constructive search space, both of those make this a lot easier. Um, then this is a heuristic method. We don't claim it can solve every given problems. Um, the experimental results shows that it normally does something every time, and it seems to do well, so we're going to take that for now. So uh, why should you be interested is always useful. Uh, this is one step in a larger software stack. We expect that with more rigid structuring of quantum development, we can get a lot better results, and rigid structuring will let us automate away a lot of the problems, which will shorten the development time and cheapen the costs. Uh, in addition, we've only done a very relatively simple GI. There's a lot more work that can be done on GIs and quantum programming, and a lot of other areas that could be automated, as well as a lot of techniques in genetic algorithms that could be moved into our GI here. Um, yeah, so just to remind you what, what we're trying to do here, we wanted a comparable method that requires less specialist knowledge, which we have. Um, our method still performed well, so we're happy with it. Uh, there's minimal fine-tuning, and there's a lot of genetic algorithm work that could be put in that could further that fine-tuning. Um, but for now, we're happy with this. But we will try and work on seeing what we can do with a more competitive GI. And even if this is the best that can be done, the main selling point isn't performance, it's ease of use. And we can definitely say that we've improved the ease of use. All right. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'll move on, because we're running low. Okay, we're live. I'm going to give this a few seconds because people were saying that the that there was a little bit of a delay in jumping from the presentation to this talk. So we'll give it 20 seconds. Yeah, it warrants um, between five and 30. Yeah. Um, yeah, wow, this is quite a piece of research, huh? Uh, kind of cross dis so much cross-disciplinary uh, stuff going on here. It's a lot less spooky than it looks. I've done very simple things cross okay. cross discipline to try and uh, to try and make it as less as little spook as possible. Um, yeah, but it is uh, a lot when you just look at it. 
So it seems like people are in the chat now, so I'll uh, relay the questions. So I think the first question asked, as far as I can see, was from Stephanie Forrest, and she's asking, how does your work compare to Lee Spector's work using GP to design quantum programs, if you're aware of that work? Yes. So if you if you do anything on GP on quantum, Lee Spector is the first book you read. Um, mm. This is what we've taken as sort of the baseline. Um, mm. Lee Spector does a lot more idea work than practical things, but he does he does everything. He's amazing. I uh, I do not want to personally compare myself to Lee Spector because he's he, he he's sort of like the man in the field. Um, so we did look at what he was doing and try and figure a few holes that there were uh, and try and try and sort things around. Um, the main one I was looking at is when we're doing our GI, we've got our, our mutation functions. Um, for quantum, it's actually quite hard to find those mutation functions. Um, so our method used what would be considered quite a strange representation. And part of the reason we chose that representation, the, the, the ZX graphs, is it allows some mutation functions that would be hard to implement otherwise. Um, so uh, it's sort of hard to compare everything we've done, but the first thing we did was we read Lee Spectre and think, all right, what else can we do on top of this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's uh, good. Uh, I'll, re I'll go on to the next question, uh, which I believe is from Wes Weimer. Uh, so Wes Weimer uh, thinks that there's been work in non-quantum non circuit optimization uh, and he points out an example as a Hume Award winner in 2015, evolutionary approach to approximate digital circuits. Uh, he's curious what the key differences between this and the quantum side are. Um, so the, the actual innate thing of having a quantum bit actually does make some physical differences in how the organization goes. Mm -hmm. um, it's much easier to represent and sort of discretize each separate function in a classical circuit optimization. So when you're, you're building that circuit, um, each thing can sort of run a separate trend. In, in quantum, they are all slightly entangled. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you do need to optimize for a circuit and for a program that runs simultaneously. Uh, and that can make it quite difficult in placing these things. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's a few ones, so I'm just going to be quite quick. Uh, we know how classical circuits work a lot better than quantum circuits. We know how to make classical algorithms, and we know how to make classical programs. Uh, it's much harder to do that for quantum ones. So when we're trying to put, um, here's how we automate how I would make a circuit. If you're doing that for quantum, it's not here it's how I would automate how I would make a quantum circuit. It's here's trying to automate something that I don't think I'd know how to do uh, quite a lot of the time. Um, and then the final one is just that, uh, Quantum computers are, are a very new field, um, so there's quite a lot of rough aroundness around the edge that, that doesn't exist so much in classical systems. Um, there's a lot of things that just don't work very well, and there's a lot of things that we just can't do. And we could work out how to do them later, but it's not cost appropriate to say, let's try and solve that now. We just sort of need to work with the problems. Uh, and that's what I'd say the three main ones are. It's that near, near-term quantum computers are much rougher. Um, the design space is more complicated and inherently parallel, so the structure is much harder to, to exploit. Um, and then the, uh, the fact that we actually don't really know how, how, how best to use quantum, when we do really know how to best uh, optimize a circuit for the most part. So uh, Wes kind of has a somewhat follow-up question for this. Uh, Retargeting is a great application, but if we were to apply GI to synthesize quantum programs from high-level specs, something that people have wanted to do for a while, what would you have to change? What are the key uh, challenges in this domain and insights? Um, so I've been, I'm looking into this. That, that, that's sort of like one of my main areas of work. Uh, the big one is scaling. If we want to make a, a reasonably safe program, this gets very complicated very quickly. Mm. Um, what I've been pushing for a lot is uh, we need the same software engineering structures that we have on classical systems. So that when we're synthesizing, we're not doing this huge, awful step. We have broken down steps that scale better. Um, and that's sort of my big thing when it comes to how do we synthesize quantum programs? Currently, the steps are quite lumped. Um, and we, I think we want to try and break these up as much as possible, automate as much as possible. 
So we're trying to work out um, what we can do on smaller level steps. Uh, and that's why I've done retargeting. It's because in the total stack of synthesizing, at some point, we want to retarget. So let's see how GI works on one step, then see if we can scale up to a different step. Um, so yeah, those are my two insights. We need software engineering structure. We need to break down the problem. Uh, one, and this is my favorite, I have no idea. <laughs> it's a very new field. Um, so th there's going to be more challenges than I know of. By, I, but I, I think for now, it, it just makes the most sense for me that we focus on single steps. And then if those work, we look at what worked and what didn't. Um, and I, I, I know there'll be theorists and you're, 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 and they'll be saying, so why are we trying this? And I'm a big fan of the idea that sometimes we just need to try things and see what happens. And that, that's a large part of, of which steps should be GI'd and which steps shouldn't. Good answer. Uh, uh, Bill has a question about error. Uh, you say that you optimize for error. Is this error on, is this error on a particular machine? Is it real or simulated? Basically, how do you measure this error? So what we've been doing is the accumulated uh, chance of a single gate causing, um, so what essentially would be a, a quantum bit flip. Um, so uh, we've got these on real machines. Um, these are, it, it's three IBM quantum machines. Um, they've been benchmarked quite, quite well. Uh, I won't go into exactly how they did that, but yeah, these are, uh, real machines. Um, I've just taken the the, the benchmark errors, uh, and then the sorry. So error on a particular machine. Yes, it's those those actual physical ones, but we can sub in. Is this real or simulated? This is real. How do you measure error? Um, essentially, we run a bunch of uh, types of circuit, and we sort of estimate how much did this cause here, uh, and and work out that was a benchmark. Um, we are assuming a bit more staticness of error than exists, but it becomes very impractical. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I had a very similar question to Bill. I'm very out of touch with this quantum computer domain. Uh, doing this sort of research with the current hardware available, is it like, I really don't know where you start with it. Is it kind of an easy thing to measure? Like, is it something you, can just write a program to do. Uh, sorry, what do you mean? Like, I'm not sure even I know what I mean at this stage. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I'll, I'll have I a mean, how, how, how do you interact with these machines to run your experiments, for example? Um, so it, it, it ends up looking a lot more like an assembly language. You mm -hmm. have um, these sort of physical actions that a machine can take, mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you put those in order. Mm -hmm. um, there are various tools that will take higher level definitions, like, for example, ZX graphs, and turn mm -hmm. those into those physical actions. Um, but it's easier to think of this like a GPU optimization than mm -hmm. um, like a Python script. Oh, okay. you, uh, and I think that helps a lot. If it's a black box quantum processing unit, mm -hmm. um, it is a little hard to work on the specifics. But uh, we have uh, less than one minute left. We have one more question. So try to, do, try to make this fast uh, from Wes. Uh, I am uh, uh, only familiar with Gover's quantum search algorithm. What sort of human understandable changes, retargeting decisions, what would does your approach make when applied to a simple algorithm like Gover's? Very quick example. If one mm -hmm. qubit on average has lower er error running a gate than another qubit, we'll move the operations from that worse qubit to the better qubit. Um, wow. <laughs> Uh, I've never seen someone answer a question about quantum computing in in ten seconds before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an art. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's the uh, end of this session. Thank you very much for your talk. We'll be moving to the next talk, which is uh, improving novelty in procedural storytelling, story story generation.